the next three weeks are going to be just slightly different than what they have been. Like I said, we're going to start a series uh, pretty much called Maranatha at the Movies. Um, we're going to dive into some Christmas movies that we would not see the Salvation Message in. And I'm going to pull some things out of it that's going to direct you towards the cross. Now, as you watch the movies, uh, you're, you're not going to that has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. Oh, it does not. But you know what? God can use anything for His glory. Now, with that being said, there are certain copyright laws that we have to abide by. So we are streaming. However, if you go back and watch, or if you're watching online now, if all of a sudden you get this little pop-up screen that says technical difficulties or, or hang tight, that just means we cannot show the videos online. Uh, we can show them here, but we cannot broadcast them. So uh, there are going to be some different things that's going to happen. But um, today we are going to talk about a topic. And I think it's, it's probably my, my second, third favorite Christmas movie. Uh, but I titled this, Are You Fighting Your Destiny? Are You Fighting Your Destiny? Now we got a couple clips. Um, and we're going to have Brother Joe... Man, our, our projector today. And if Brother Joe, if you would, go ahead and start that first clip for us. So we probably have all seen this movie called The Santa Claus. Now in this movie, we, we, we have watched it and we've seen it and we've gone through it. And, and we understand that there's some things that happen in this movie. But at the particular clip that we're talking about today, Scott Calvin had a decision to make. He had a choice to either put on the coat or to not put on the coat. Obviously, sometimes he f would fight the decision sometimes to put the coat on, but he decided that he put the coat on somewhat under distress, but under the, the, the nudging of someone else, he he eventually put the coat on, and as he put the coat on, things started to happen within his life. God has given us the power and the opportunity to change our lives and our paths. That starts in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Then you jump down to Romans 10, 9 and 10, and it talks about how if we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that he will save us. It says that we, we confess with our mouth and we believe with our heart. Then it goes on to say that anyone, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So it says that anybody can, can have this opportunity be presented to them. It says, this is not an empty response to a question that has no meaning. Now, obviously, Scott Calvin, when he put on this, this jacket, he was just putting on a jacket of somebody that vanished right in front of him. And as he put this jacket on, he didn't realize it, but we understand as you go into the movie, they throw a magnifying glass over the card, and they realize around the, the rim of the card there is a clause, and as the clause states, if you put the coat on, you become Santa Claus. And so my, my, what I'm trying to tell you is this, is, is sometimes we have an opportunity to change our lives, and once we put a coat on, we have to begin to act as that coat is asking us and telling us to act. Scott had a decision, and that decision was a huge one. He didn't realize it at the time. All he was doing was, was appeasing his child so his, his kid would quit bugging him, and he, kept, and he went on. But as we saw as he walked to the back of that sleigh and he picked up the bag, all of a sudden the bag began to do something else because the bag was attached to the jacket, to the coat. And as it was attached to the coat, we have to understand that there's things in our lives that are attached together. The most trans transformational thing that we will ever do is answer the question, will you put on the coat? Will you put it on? The most important question you will ever answer in your life, yes or no. God will visit us when we least expect him sometimes. And it would change our world. Scott and his son were fast asleep. Now, here's the thing. This is what I want to go back to John 3, 16. We all know the story of, of, of Christmas. We all know the, the magic of Santa Claus. We all know that he visits us on Christmas Eve. We know because we have been told and we've been taught that he is going to visit us on Christmas Eve. And as he visits us on Christmas Eve, we know what to look for. 
we go into the scriptures and we understand who the Messiah is because God did not leave it out. God showed us exactly who we are to look for and exactly how it was going to come to be and how it was going to come to pass. So we understand that, that we know when it's going to happen. We understand that Jesus Christ has already came. We understand that he's coming back. But we also understand that we have to say yes to him to, to reap the benefits of this relationship. We understand that Santa Claus is going to come when we're asleep. Sometimes Jesus is going to come into our life when we least expect it. We could be fast asleep in our own world. We could be fast asleep in our own mind. We could be fast asleep covered by the worries of the world because we get busy sometimes, right? How many people have forgotten some extremely important that you were not going to forget, you were not going to write down because it was that important, you, you weren't going to forget, then all of a sudden you got busy and you realized you forgot? Did it ever happen to you? Well, it never happened to me. <laughs> it doesn't because I have a walking, living notebook that texts me every time there's something important to do, and it is called the Becca book. <laughs> the Becca never lets me forget anything. The Becca will remind me when I don't need to be reminded. The Becca will tell me things to do when I didn't think I had to do them. Right, So the Becca book never runs out of batteries. It never has a lapse of memory. It never stops. The Becca book is on sale today for $5.95. No, I'm just kidding. But, but sometimes, you know, we have to write things down. We get busy. And so here it is, you know, Scott and his son, they're sleeping. They're fast asleep, and all of a sudden they hear something. Something awakens them, and as they get, aw they get awoke from their, their sleep, they realize somebody's on my roof. Somebody's about to break into my house. And, and we find, uh, I've got three examples of people in the scriptures that were busy with life, but yet God invaded their space to change the world. And first was Noah. Noah was living his life. Noah was doing what Noah did. Noah was living in a drought. He was living in a world of evil. And God came and told him, I'm going to flood the earth. You need to build an ark. And as you do, you need to do this. And what happened? God did exactly what he said he was going to do. Let, let, let's fast forward to Moses. Moses was running. He, he made some mistakes. He was doing his thing. He was in the desert living his life. And all of a sudden, God showed up in the form of a burning bush and said, you're going, to do, you're going out and you're going to deliver my people from bondage. What did Moses do? He delivered God's people from bondage. What about Paul? Paul was going to... to to, to uh, throw people in jail. He was going to persecute the church even more. And as he was busy doing his thing, God blinded him with a visitation on the road to Damascus. And as he was going, God stopped him right in his tracks. We get busy with life, but even though we get busy with life, God is still going to invade our space, and we're going to have the opportunity to say yes or to say no. All three of these individuals said yes to God. God's timing is perfect, and we must be ready for that visitation. Most of us in this room have already said yes, and we've already put the coat on. And so later on in the sermon, we're going to get to you. But, but some of us have not made that decision yet. Some of us have not put the coat on. The coat is still laying there in the snow, and the person has vanished, and it's ready for us. We flip the card over, and it says, if something happens to me, put the coat on, and the reindeer will know what to do. God's timing is perfect. God did not ask us if he could visit us. He told us he was going to visit and give us an opportunity to change our life and to change our future. God told us he was going to be here for us. But it's up to us to allow him to change us. God did not ask if we were ready. God knows you're not ready. That's why he's showing up to get you ready for his return. He knows that none of us are clean. He knows that none of us are, are put together like we should be put together. But even so, he still shows up. Even so, he still stops us in our tracks and makes us. It's not a little hole that we can just step over. It's not a little rock we can just kick out of our way. But it is a roadblock that we have to physically decide if we're going to allow this roadblock to stop us and to change our path, or if we're going to do everything possible in our own strength to overcome that roadblock and to continue on in the path that we're going. It's up to us 
God did not wait until morning when everything was ready, when you had your, your suit on, when you had your hair brushed out of your face. God did not wait until you was ready to understand what was going on. But he showed up when he knew he needed to show up because God knows everything about us. He showed up at the perfect time. We have to understand that once we try on the coat, we are responsible for all that it is. The coat comes with a clause. The coat comes with a to-be list. Saying yes to the card or to the coat is only the beginning. And the second is saying yes to our destiny. It's saying yes to God's plan for our life. My question to you is, when this day's over, will there be enough said for you to say yes to your destiny? When this day's over, will you say, be, have enough in your mind and your heart to say yes to trying on the coat? Well, see, that is the opportunity. But the movie, nor does God call, stop there. Go to our next clip. Old Scott, he didn't know what he was getting into, did he? You see, we have an opportunity. And then once we say yes to the opportunity, once we accept that opportunity, change begins to happen within our life. When we put the coat on, we choose to become different. When you say yes to Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, you're choosing to be different than everybody else. When you're choosing to be different than your pastor, you're choosing to be different than your mom and your dad, you're choosing to be different than who you were before you said yes. We might not feel like we are different. We might not see differently. We might not realize that it's all started already. But others begin to see there's a change in you. You see, I think it's kind of funny how, how Scott was just was fighting it the whole time. And he was fighting. But 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 is a very familiar scripture. It says this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. Then it says this, a new life has begun. Once we say yes to Jesus, no matter who you were or what you were or what you did, that's gone. It's past. Something new has begun in your life. And now you are a brand new person. It's like you have went through metamorphosis and you stepped outside of your shell and you become that thing that God has said that you are. It doesn't matter the decisions that you made that might have put you in a place that you didn't want to go to. It doesn't matter the, the hurt that you went through to get to where you are now. All that matters is you said yes, and now a change has begun in your life. Nothing is the same after God begins to work on you. No matter what you feel like, no matter that you might not feel that you're different, you might not think differently, you might still think everything is okay, you might, you might still do the same things that you did before you said yes to Jesus. But it doesn't mean God's not working on you. Because God is working on you. And as He works on you, sometimes it takes time for us to catch up to God's work. God begins to work on us in such a way that it is, it is it's like lightning going through us. It's like going through a, a, a time warp. Like you see in some of the, the, uh, the sci-fi movies. And all of a sudden the stars are just, instead of being stars, are just white lights going past you because it's going so fast. God begins to change you so much that it takes time for your mind to pick up and to catch up to what he's doing. But you have to understand that, that we have worked such a little bit of time, right? Some of us are 45, some of us are 80, some of us are, are 17, some of us are young. But, but we've had this little bit of time to, to make out who we are. But we understand that God knew this day was going to happen so he's had eternity to understand that this day was going to happen. He's had eternity with us on his mind. Knowing that we were going to come up to a point of time to where God was going to change us. Either we was going to say yes, we was going to say no. But sometimes it takes time for us to understand what God wants us to do. Sometimes we are encouraged and we're pushed into, not, not necessarily, that's, that's the wrong word, we're not pushed in, but we're encouraged to, to accept Jesus as our Savior because somebody has changed our life and made an impression on us. We understand that God is good and God is going to change us and help us. And we, we, we become saved, we become Christians, and we start acting like those people that, that they inspired us to become a Christian. Have you ever, ever done that? I'm sure every one of us have. 
well, my mom and my dad, they were the best. I'm going to be just like mom and dad. And we started acting like mom and dad, but, but God didn't call us to be mom and dad. God didn't call us to be the youth pastors. God didn't call us to act like our, our pastor. He didn't call us to act like our Sunday school teacher. God called you to be you. And as he called you to be you, we have to understand that he's going to begin to, to change us. Psalms 139, 13 says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. He understand what you were going to go through. He understand what you was going to need. He understood what he needed you to have to fulfill the destiny he created for you. I can stop for a second. Take my breath. Let that sink in. He knew what he needed to place in you to fulfill the destiny that he created for you. Some of that stuff he needed to place in you was some of the hardships that you had to go through. Some of the loss that you had to suffer. Because he, he knew that how you were going to react once you allowed his grace and his mercy to wrap itself around those things to get you to where he needed you to get to so you could perform and live in the destiny that he had created for you. Does God always do bad things? Absolutely not. Does He want harm come to you? Absolutely not. But He knew the decisions and the path that you were going to take. He knew what was going to happen. And because of that, He knew where He needed to be in your life to change that from bad to good, just like He did with Joseph. God does not have to read an instruction manual to fix you. God does not have to bring out the Steps 1 through 45, A through Z, to make sure the right screw goes into the right place so this thing don't fall apart. Right? Don't you love that? Don't you love, you? Oh, this is a, it's a little box, right? I mean, little. It, it, it weighs about five pounds. You can carry it under one arm. You open it up, and there's 87 pieces to put together something that you can put a flower on. And you realize if you miss one spot, one, one step, one piece, one screw, that whole thing can fall apart. But see, God's not worried about reading the instruction manual because He wrote it. He designed you. He's the engineer that put you together, and He doesn't need somebody to tell Him how to fix you. He doesn't need somebody to tell Him how to put things in the right place. He created it. He understands that. Sometimes it takes an outsider to get us to see what's up. I love that scene. Scott's sitting at the soccer field out on the bench watching this kid play soccer the little girl sees him she and she she knew what was going on she knew who that was he, she begins to walk over to him and you see sometimes you don't understand why people are drawn to you but they see something in you that you have not accepted or seen in yourself because they feel god working in you you might not understand it because you haven't accepted it because you don't want that to be your destiny for whatever reason. You don't want that. So you're, you're pushing it away and you're not seeing it. But yet the little girl saw who Scott Calvin was becoming. He under, she understood who Scott Calvin was. And, and as she saw him, she was being drawn. And she, she sat down and she, she, she kind of kept her, her, her distance just a little bit. And she, she, she saw it. She scooted a little bit. And then it, it got to the point to where she got so close. Don't you love it when somebody gets so close to you? And you're, you're trying to ignore them. I got my bubble. Stay out of my bubble. But as soon as your bubbles pop, you understand, and your mind can't go to nothing else, but that person's inside your bubble, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. My little girl, sometimes she'll get up in the middle of the night, she'll come sleep in our bed. That's fine. We know we're trying to break her out of that. It's time for her to be a big girl. But sometimes, and she's done it recently because we're, whatever reason, but sometimes she comes in the bed, and sometimes she's a, angel when she sleeps i mean she don't move sometimes she is sideways she's kicking she's throwing the covers you get an elbow or a hand flops like this and it wakes you up she's pushing you this little 30 pound little girl is pushing big old daddy off the bed right sometimes and the thing is is, is when i know she's there now i can't go back to sleep because she's in my bubble and this is how Scott was. She, he understood this little girl was in his bubble. So he turned around and said, what? And sometimes we get to that point where we turn around and somebody says, what? And that little girl, all she did was the only thing she knew what to do. Sit on Santa Claus's lap and tell him what she wanted. You see, 
His destiny was seeking him out, even though he wasn't willing to accept it at that particular moment. We are walking in places in, in, in time, and we're doing things that we are not allowing our, 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 our destiny to catch up to us because we're trying to fight it. We're trying to push it away. But this little girl was starting to show Scott who he was and who he was becoming. She was seeing what was changing in him. Sometimes it takes an outsider or someone outside our own head to show us what's going on. Scott went to the doctor. Everything was changing. Well, Scott, there's nothing wrong with you. You're healthy as a horse, but, but you, you are changing. We try to act like nothing has changed. We are trying to be the same person as before. This, this kind of bothers me a little bit because sometimes when we become Christians, we try not to let go of that world because we say if we don't let go of that world, we can reach them. But if we don't separate ourselves enough from that world, we're not going to reach and change anybody because we have not removed ourselves from such world. We are still right there. But God has called us to be different. He has called us to be separated. He has called us to step out of what we were and to change into who we are in Him. We have to understand that we have to separate it, but we work hard trying to, to stay who we were so I can be relevant. I, I love it. In the church now, we have to be relevant. And to be relevant, we have to look like everybody else on TV. That's okay. If you want to wear skinny jeans, wear skinny jeans. I ain't wearing skinny jeans. I'm not going to do it. You know, if you want to wear cool like that, I, there, there's this one guy I watch on, online. Uh, he's in Seattle, Judah Smith. He, he, he's a great communicator. Uh, he, he has a church that he took over from his dad. He's a great guy, but he wears these pants, the, the, the hipsters, to wear the high waters. You know, back in the day, when I was in school, high waters were bad. You didn't want your socks to show, right? You wanted your, your pants to be below your shoe tops. Because once they started coming up, people picked on you. Oh, you got high waters. You ain't got no money. You got high waters. You can't afford the right clothes. But now that's the style. Now, now you want high waters. You want them really tight. You want holes all in your pants, which is fine. That's okay. No big deal. I'm not, I'm not uh, knocking, you know, style. But what I'm saying is, is, is that has become popular in another aspect of the world and not, not what, what, what God is doing, but we get to the point where we got to be so relevant that we become and we begin to look just like them. Sometimes we begin to do the same things that they're doing so we can reach them. We don't understand that what, what the things that we're doing and, and as much as we're giving away to them to be like them, we're giving away the power of the Holy Spirit that has been able to change us. And if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot lead anybody to the cross. We have to be separated. We work hard trying to be the person that we were and not who we are becoming. I love that last little clip. Scott shaved. Oh, yeah, I got it perfect. And just like that, he turned right back to who God said he was. Sometimes we don't like what God said we're going to be because that, there's a challenge that he's given us. There is work that we're going to have to do. There are things that we're going to have to give up. We're not willing to do that. If I give up that, then I can't do this. If, if I do what you're asking me to do here, I, I, I can't do that. And I've got to do this because I've done it forever. Back whenever I used to travel a lot playing flag football, all the tournaments were on the weekends. You know, you had a two-day tournament, three-day tournament. You, you start playing on Friday nights. If you're good enough, you played on Saturday. If you're really good, you got into the, the knockout tournament uh, rounds on Sunday. And the championship was usually 3 or 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon and you drive home. The only problem is, is where's church in that? You don't have church. Your church is on the, on the field. Sometimes I would travel, but once I really started getting into God and, and God really started changing my life, that started getting pushed to the side. I love flag football. If I could get in the league right now, I'll play it right now. But I got to the point where I had to make a decision. Do I give up flag football? Do I give up all my tournaments and go to church? Or do I go to church when there's not a tournament? Well, I gave up my tournaments. And so I started getting offended a little bit because then they wouldn't call me to go to tournaments. I'm like, I, I'm still good. I still got my skills. I can still move. I can still pull flags. I can still do this. But they understood that I was going to say no. Or I'll go down there and I'll play Friday and Saturday. But I was leaving Saturday afternoon so I can get back home for church on Sunday. It's like, if you can't make the whole time, we don't need you. You can still play in our leagues. But we, sometimes we have to make a decision that's going to be hard 
for us to make because we don't want to give up the things that we've been doing for our whole life. But God is asking us to do so. Our destiny or our calling is sometimes hard for us to see and surrender to. It could change over the years to accomplish God's plan. Because see, your destiny will never change. But the things that are incorporated within your destiny and have to fulfill that destiny will change. Because you might be in this city for once. I have a destiny. It started in Augusta, Georgia. It moved me to Athens. It moved me back to Augusta. It moved me to Gainesville. It moved me to Alabama. Thank God that was only for a year. <laughs> it moved me back to Georgia. Hey, UGA, we can't win a game though. And now it moved me to Louisiana. My destiny has never changed. But things with inside of my destiny has caused me to have to change certain things and to move certain things and to let go of certain things. We have to understand that God is going to call you and He has called you. He has placed something inside of you. You have a destiny for you to fulfill. And that destiny might look differently three months from now as it does right now. But your destiny never changes. Well, Pastor, you just, you just, you just made a fupa. You just said your destiny changes. Things with inside of your destiny changes. The call in your life never changes. We have to be in the habit of saying yes when God is calling us to move. I've got two more clips. Go ahead and show that third clip. You see, sometimes we have to begin to believe in what God is calling us. Sometimes we have to begin to believe what God has done inside of us. You see, Charlie knew who his dad was. We have people in our life that know who we are. I'm not talking about people trying to keep you to who you were. But they know who you are. And because they know who you are, it's going to be that little person that, that's saying something to you to continue you on your journey and your path to what God is calling you. Charlie knew that his dad was different. And because of that, he knew that he had to show his dad in some way, some fashion, who he was. Now, you know, within the movie... The, the head elf, right now I'm having a, a, a mind lapse because my Becca book ran out of batteries and she didn't tell me what his name was. But he gave Charlie this, this snow globe and he says, anytime you want to see your dad, all you got to do is shake it and he can come back to you. And only the true believers will see the sleigh flying within the globe. And so Charlie knew that if I could get my dad to see that, he's going to begin to believe and he's going to understand. And so because of the belief of little Charlie and as he threw the snow globe to his dad, his dad saw that. God is putting people in your life to show you, encourage you to believe what he has done in you. Maybe you're not where you're supposed to be right now. Maybe you're not doing what God has said that you can do. But I'm telling you, God has got somebody in your life that is urging you and, and, and pushing you to that place that he is needing you to go for you to believe in him. How many tears have you shed trying to figure out who you are in God. How many tears and how many sleepless nights have you had? How many times have you been sitting in the dark trying to figure this thing out? This is the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. It's easy working at this job because this boss tells me exactly what I'm supposed to do. And if I don't know, I'll go to the employee handbook and I find out what I'm supposed to do. It's easy being a parent, even though that's the hardest job in the world, because we understand what our job is, to love and to protect and to raise our children. But being a Christian sometimes is hard, because sometimes we don't give God enough credit that He is speaking to us because we're not worthy enough to hear His voice. Is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? God, <laughs> really, are you serious? This is me. You know what I did. 
How can I be worthy enough to fulfill the call that all these people are saying that are on my life? Because God knew you and He created your destiny just for you. He knows who you are. And He's put people in your life to help you believe that. But the only way to believe that is just that. You have to believe what God has done in you. You have to step out of what you were and to step into who you are. You have to begin to allow God to change you in a way that now you believe it. And you understand that you can do something in this world. What would happen in this movie if Scott Calvin decided, I'm not doing it? Christmas would stop. Kids would have broken hearts. What would happen if we continued to sit on the pews and tell God, no, I don't have what it takes. I don't believe in myself. I can't do this. What's going to happen? The same thing that's happening right now in our church world. The church is going to continue falling apart. People are going to continue walking away from the message that can change their life. People are going to walk the streets in hurt and heartache, not knowing there is a solution inside these small walls. But because we won't get out of the pews and get out of the building and believe God will use us, There's one more clip. Joe, go ahead and show that. We come apart, come to a part in the movie now to where Scott has understood and he has given himself to his destiny. He is no longer Scott Calvin. He don't answer to that name anymore. But now he is who the coach said that he was going to be. We finally see ourselves as God sees ourselves once we understand the change that has happened in us. But until we understand the change that's happened in us, we will never see ourselves as God sees us. But once we do when we begin to see who God sees, we begin to believe in who we are. But until you begin to see who God sees and who He says you are, you will never believe in yourself. Once we see ourselves as God does, nothing can change our mind. Just like that scene showed, Santa Claus was putting the stuff under the tree. And as the cops come in, they grab him. And as they grab him or taking him to, to, to jail, he doesn't do anything. And they said, let Santa Claus go, the little kid said. And he understood who he was. He understood that there was going to be things that was going to happen. He understood that this wasn't in the, in the handbook. He understood that, that Santa Claus was supposed to be something different. And I'm telling you that even though you might go through some hardships, some, some struggles and some, some, some difficult times, once you begin to believe in who God says you are, nothing will ever change your mind. It doesn't matter what comes your way. You have already put your foot down and said, this is who I am. And nobody and nothing can ever change me from believing what God says and who God says that I am. And in Isaiah 61, verse 10, it says this. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation, draped me in the robes of righteousness, like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding for a bride with her jewels. God has dressed you and clothed you the way he needs to dress and clothe you. There are things that he has placed inside of you that you have not even touched in yet. You might have been pastors for a long time. You might have been a Christian for 40, 50, 60 years. But I'm still telling you there are things that God has placed in you that you have not tapped into yet because it has not been time. But I'm telling you the time is coming when you're going to tap into this and you're going to begin to understand exactly why things happen the way they happened in your life. God is not, he's not made a mistake when he wrote your story. God did not make a mistake when he brought you to this earth at this time. God did not make a mistake on the day you put on the coat and had to make the decision, yes or no. God knew that time was coming. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence 
It's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We understand that when we walk in His path, these scriptures come to life. When we walk in these paths, the hope and the joy and the happiness that we're searching for will be found when we follow after Him. But if we're not following after Him, those things that we deem as happiness, we deem as joy, we deem as fulfillment, will begin to lose their pleasure. We'll begin to lose their luster. And we'll begin to lose their fulfillment within our life because it's not from Him. But when we walk after Him, we will have all the fullness that only the Spirit of God can give us. 2 Corinthians 3, 16, starting at verse 3, starting at verse 16 says this. This is the message. Whenever, though, they turn to face God as Moses did, He removes the veil and there they are, face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is a living personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We are free from it, all of us. Nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of His face. And so we are transformed or transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Him. This scripture gives you a great illustration of, of just how this movie goes. Because Scott was, was faced with a challenge. He was faced with a decision. Put the coat on or not to put the coat on. And as he put the coat on, the veil of what was going to happen to him began to fall away because now things in his life begin to change. And just as this says, once we begin and get into the face of God, once we have that veil removed and see who God is, we begin to understand things a little differently than what we did before we understood him and had his wisdom working in our life. You see, human wisdom is not like God's wisdom. We might be able to break down the scripture. We might be able to open up the, the original language and the original text. We might be able to, to say, okay, well, it was preached to these people at this time for this reason. Let's relate it to this. But when we put it towards God's wisdom, and God begins to tell you and show you why he wrote it at that particular moment in time, things begin to open up, and we begin to understand the things that we think are holding us down are really the things that are giving us the freedom to live life the way God has said that we can live life. But when that veil has been removed and we begin to see who Jesus Christ is in our life, we begin to understand that He is a personal, living God. He is not some statue that we see in the yard. He is not some, some idol that we have to look up to and do things a certain way. But we understand we're going to mess up. We understand that He is going to be right there where we are. And when we mess up and fall, He's going to reach down and He's going to pick us up. And we understand the more we walk with Him, the more we will become like Him. And the less we're going to be Scott Calvin the more we're going to walk and to be who we're supposed to be within our destiny my question to you is this have you picked up your coat have you placed it on have you tied the sash have you allowed things to change in your life the way God wants them to change in your life not what you think needs to happen Not, 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 not the way you think it, it has to happen in the order it has to happen. Because see, sometimes our order stops God from moving in our life. God is not a God of confusion. But He also knows us better than we know ourselves. And He knows how it has to go. The joy of the season took place 2,000 years ago in a quiet town. And that joy still beams here today. We lose that joy when we don't look to the one to where our help comes. But when we look to the hills and stand up and put on that coat, joy overwhelms us and nothing can hold us down. So my question to you is this. Are you, Scott, running from your destiny? Or are you, Charlie, opening the eyes of those that are confused? You're one or the other. You're one or the other. Derek, if y'all would come, I'm.
My question is this. As we take a fantasy movie about the magic of Christmas, and every one of us has probably seen that movie, and we probably sat back and laughed at that movie, and obviously I've got the DVD at my house, and I was watching it a little bit last night, and I've got some other stuff that I like to watch. There's some, some, some old Christmas stuff I watched as a kid that I found on DVD that my wife went out and watch with me. That's just so stupid. But it, it's, 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 it's mine. It's, it's my childhood. It makes me think of when life was, was a lot easier. Because it's easier when you're a kid, right? You don't have a lot of responsibility. You just do what you do. Mom and dad can take care of everything. But as I begin this, this series, I really felt that this was going to be the kickoff. Are you running from your destiny? There's only one person that can answer that question. And it's you. 